Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Michael Morgenstern. I'm the head of marketing for the Expert Institute. Today's webinar is on the topic of retail safety. Our presenter is Jerry Bernback, a renowned retail safety and design expert. Mr. Bernback has been in the retail industry for over 40 years. He studied at the New York Institute of Technology and the City University of New York City College. He was awarded the honor of Fellow of the Institute of Store Planners and has been widely published on his craft with features in publications such as Display Design Ideas, where he served as a contributing editor, and New York Magazine. Currently, he's the principal of his own retail store planning and consulting firm, which specializes in store layout, design, and safety, whose clients have included all of the world's major big box retailers. At the end of the presentation, there will be some time for Q&A. Please type your questions into the question box in your control panel and Mr. Bernbach will answer you verbally. Thanks again for attending and please welcome Jerry Bernbach. Good afternoon everybody. I'd like to thank Michael and the Expert Institute for allowing me to participate in this webinar and for all of you who have taken time out of your busy day, I appreciate it and hope you'll walk away with something of value from this webinar. I guess the first big decision I had to make today was to determine if we were going to pre-record this or do the way of Donald Trump and ad-lib it. And I felt that we might as well ad-lib it. And if I get out of line, you can let me know at the end. Uh, the topic for today is retail safety and design. And what I'd like all of you to walk away with today is a clear understanding of all the contributing factors that lead to customer and employee accidents and how most of these events could have been avoided. We can all agree that people are human and unknowingly place themselves in a situation of injuring themselves as a result of poor judgment. When accidents occur in a store, the retailer is the first person that we try to point a finger of blame to. But actually, in my experience, another customer or a product manufacturer or a display company contributor had to put a cause to the accident. So I turn to a act which is referred to as the Occupier Liability Act. And in this act, it states that retailers are obligated to provide the customer with a safe, non-hazardous store. In their section 3.1, they state an occupier of the premises owes a duty to take such care as in all the circumstances of the case are reasonable to see that people entering on the premises and the property brought onto the premises by these people are reasonably safe while on the premise. The OLA imposes an affirmative duty on occupiers to make their premises reasonably, and I repeat, reasonably safe by taking reasonable care to protect persons entering onto them from foreseeable harm. However, this duty is not, is not absolute. The standard of reasonableness requires neither perfection nor unrealistic or impractical precaution against known risks. As an example, a business owner is not required to stand around and observe to or follow each customer and instantly sweep up any spilled item or a debris that might be found on the floor. To meet the standard of care, a business system of inspection and maintenance should be explained thoroughly to the staff and recorded in writing as this is the retailer's rebuttal to the fact that they did not provide a hazardous free environment. These written records are essential to establishing that the business system of inspection and maintenance are working effectively when a slip and fall occurs. 
Next slide. Most people look, but they don't see. So what do I mean by this statement? It's something that I often discuss with my clients when discussing customer habits. The reality is I'd like all of you to just participate in this short exercise and I'd like you to read the sentence below. I'll give you 30 seconds and tell me and we will put it uh, in a um, response to our headquarter here. I'd like you to tell me how many letter F's appear in a sentence. So if you're ready, I'd like to say, ready, set, go, read that sentence. Ten more seconds. Okay, we're going to put up now the answer sheet. And if you don't mind, we'd like you to just punch in what you think, think is the correct number of letter Fs in this sentence. I would imagine that some of you are very surprised that we've got more than one possibility here. So let's see how we all made out in this particular exercise. And we'll go to the next slide. We will have the results of the survey, but it's interesting to note that in prior seminars that I've conducted, in a group of perhaps 250 store designers, we had a variation of results from the answer of three Fs, four, five, or six Fs. The answer is six Fs. Now, I use this exercise because it shows us that there's discrepancy in what we see because our mind is not necessarily getting that transmission correctly. And the answer again was six, but because we're not translating the letter F as an F sound when we read the word of, many of us are going to answer that there were three and not the right answer that there were six. So what we've learned from this is that a group of perhaps attorneys who spend a good part of their day reading testimony and judgment um, weren't able to decipher the correct answer, which only goes to prove that many of us look, but we do not see. Next slide. Aha. Well, this is quite interesting. This is the percentage of our group out there and how they rated. So the people who answered three were subject to the fact that they didn't see or didn't perceive the letter F in of. The people who did four or five, interesting enough, found a couple of those guys but didn't find all of them. And the 23% that came up with six, you can come to the head of the class. Next slide. And next slide. Okay, so now let's consider the possibilities that go into a retail injury. Interesting statistic. Walmart estimates that there are 245 
million visitors per week in their stores. That would average to approximately 35 million per day. Kroger Supermarket hires 400,000 employees, most of which are at store level. The National Retail Found Federation is a group that does a lot of surveying of retail, and they're estimating that 245 million customers go through stores on Black Friday weekend. And lastly, the retail industry employs approximately 28 million people who are in store daily. So I ask you, what are the odds of how a retailer is going to wind up when it comes to customer exposure or employee accident when in fact most of them, or 23 percent of them, can only are seeing and looking and the remainder don't and with the amount of population that are traveling in stores I think we can all agree that it is highly likely that accidents at retail level are pretty common and often. So the issue now is what can we do about that? Next slide. So quickly I came up with a clever slogan because ultimately it's in the uh, retailer's interest to have a happy shopper because that's going to translate into filling their coffer. When it comes to injured shopper, that has a tendency to really empty the coffer. Next slide. So what have we determined at this point? People look and do not see, and retailers have a very high traffic count, which leaves their exposure to accidents extremely high. And if you look inside these iconic squares, there are a lot of obvious injuries that can occur as a result of items and issues at store level. And there's probably a hundredfold more that are not illustrated here. So safety really has to become paramount to the retailer as well as the consumer when they're shopping. Next slide. So a common cause of slipping and falling. Liquid spills are probably one of the largest factors when it comes to people slipping, mainly because there's an item called coefficient of friction, which is how our foot responds to a surface. And we know when you ice skate, it's a different sensation than when we're walking on gravel or sandpaper or something rough blacktop and therefore our body gets adjusted to these particular um, textures and feelings and start to fall into a pattern of dealing with that particular uh, response. But when a new surface or a new coefficient of friction is introduced, our body has a tendency of not registering it quickly and therefore go off balance. So liquid is a very common reason for why we fall. In stores, there are so many elements and items on shelves that there is, it's likely that some of them can wind up on the floor, especially when you have customers who are really not watching what they're doing and allow items that have fallen on the floor to remain on the floor. The floor material itself, there's a great movement in the vinyl uh, tile industry to add texture two tiles in order to get a better traction on the foot. And aisle widths are a very important issue in terms of navigating and being able to walk a straight line without having to go through obstacle courses. How do we prevent some of these items from affecting customers and employees? Well, there has been 
movements within many store chains to actually have patrols that go around the store continually throughout the day, especially in grocery stores where you have a lot of moisture and food that could possibly fall on the floor. And their job is to go and inspect to see if any of these items have occurred, and if so, to take immediate action to report it, to have it cleaned up, to block off that area so customers aren't exposed to it. And also there are ADA, which is American Disability Act standards, which if followed, will help reduce some of these issues. Next slide. In this particular case, we're dealing with product loading and the failure to take the right measures in order to show product to customers. It happens that in the retail business, it's very common for store managers to want to improve their volume and sales, so the only way they can do it is to take the store plan that was handed to them, and by the way, was designed to follow all regulations and requirements, and they take these plans and they modify them. They steal a couple of inches from this aisle, they steal a couple of inches from another aisle, they start to stack items one on top of another, and they start to try to do a consolidation in order to pick up more square footage. The result of this is catastrophic. In, the partic in this particular case, if you look at that white piece of furniture, you're going to notice that it's sitting on top of a flat, smooth piece of furniture. The problem here is that when you take something and put it on four points, those are the only four points that are supporting the item. And as a result, the item can and easily, if bumped into by a customer, actually slide off that ledge and tumble on top of an individual. That's not good. There are ways to prevent this by actually creating what is referred to as a positive connection and that positive connection will allow the furniture to at least stay in place if it's knocked into it. However, in this particular store, the store staff and the store manager made a conscientious effort to place this on top to get more square footage selling and as a result created a situation in which a customer did bang into it, the furniture fell on the individual and created a, a major injury to that person and it really was quite avoidable had they followed their regulations. In addition to add insult to injury, they have very restricted aisles in the store so that forces customers to brush against the product and not only are they in violation of fire codes, they now have created a liability which is really going to hurt them on the bottom line when the lawsuit is litigated. Next slide. The cause of this particular accident is a result of the display that was provided to them by a vendor. Now, as a backstory to the backstory, the relationship between vendors and retailers are kind of strange. The vendor gets called upon by a retailer very often to provide displays because the retailer doesn't want to go through the investigation and design development to come up with a display. And in essence, the vendor is really more knowledgeable as to the best way to sell their product. So the vendor eventually winds up being the individual that's going to design this display out. But selfishly, the vendor is interested in saving money, so they try to come up with a one-size-fits-all solution. 
Now, in doing that, they're counting on the various retailers that this display is going to go into to come up with the correct apparatus for their display to sit on. In this particular case, the vendor supplied the item at no cost to the store, and they allowed the store personnel to oversee the installation. The results were disastrous. There were no industry standards established. And as an important note, the retail industry is really unique in the sense that there are little to no industry standards that are set in stone, written down, or where you can go and research and find. And I will get into that in a few minutes. So the question is, where is the industry standard of care written? The answer is nowhere. So how is an attorney supposed to make a qualified statement as to the liability that the retailer created when they allowed this condition to occur in the store? Well, it is elementary, Watson, at least to a retail expert witness. The background here is that the shopping cart, which was pushed by a customer, was trying to make a right turn with the cart into a main aisle. The cartwheel, however, got stuck on the corner of the vendor display platform. You can see that in the left photograph, that the bumper of the shopping cart is now over the base of the vendor display. And as a result of that condition, the wheel locked up, as you can see in the photo on the right, where the cart actually can make a turn around the display just by pivoting. So what happened there is that the wheel locks up on an edge, and to the customer it appeared to be frozen in place, so the customer tried to release it, and in doing so, pushed back, and because these wheels are on a pivot, the cart immediately jerked and dislodged itself causing the customer to fall with the shopping cart on top of them. If the store was in regulation, it would never have happened because over time, even though I've said to you there is no written industry standard, the shopping cart companies, along with the display companies, came up with a happy medium and a standard that they all follow. That standard was that every base in the store using a shopping cart will be six inches off the floor. So that enables this front bumper to bang into their uh, store display bumper, and that allows the cart to stop in place and veer off into another direction. We've all experienced that sensation because shopping in a store, our eyes are focused on product and we're not necessarily trying to drive through obstacle courses. So what happened here and the fallacy of this particular vendor display was at some point, I'm sure there was a meeting at home office. I'm sure that the, the vendor brought in this display and I'm pretty sure that the retailer in their experimental room, takes the display, puts it on their six inch high base deck, which is found in every part of the store, and looks at it and says, this is great, let's do it. But they fail to communicate to the store that when this display comes in, it needs to sit on a six inch base. Instead, the vendor sends in their supervisors, who are basically inventory and order takers, tell them to set up the display, they go to the location in the store. The store manager, who theoretically should have been there overseeing this, walks away, and they leave this space sitting on the floor, and it's only two inches above the floor, thus the problem, and created a liability scenario, which really led to a very serious design, uh, dis, uh, injury. In addition, there's 20 more stores were allowed to set up similar to this, which is not good. So regulation, review, having real um, directives going out to the store 
are really essential to the health of customers. Next. Now, this is kind of the other end of the spectrum when it comes to vendor display. Normally, in the last display I mentioned, the vendor takes the approach, what's the least expensive way of producing a display and getting away with it? In this particular case, this vendor created a patented item which was injection molded. The minute a display goes to injection molding, there could be a sixty, seventy thousand dollar investment on the vendor's part to save in the actual production of these clear canisters. Ultimately, if you do enough of these displays, it pays off very well to the vendor because of the economy of scale as to what these unit prices will eventually wind up with when you're doing a hundred or two hundred thousand of them. So in this particular case, an injection molded part was created. The reality of injection molding is that the entire component can, is usually within thousands of an inch in tolerance, so they're really, really well engineered. The issue here is that in the black housing, which is made out of metal, this plastic is allowed to slide in, drop down. So the, the photo on the left is showing you two plastic circle knobs that were inserted into that groove and allowed to slide down and then nestled nicely in this groove. The problem is that this canister holds candy. And in order for a customer to obtain this candy, they've got to uh, raise a lever at the front of the canister that lifts up a, um, a, a piece of metal which enables the candy to now drop down through a chute and into the customer's bag. It's a simple operation. Lift the handle, put the bag underneath, boom, you've got candy. The problem in the design concept here is that when you're lifting the handle, you're also allowing the component to lift. The simple solution actually would have been to create a positive connection at the top of the canister and a 10 cent screw would have done the trick. Instead it was not picked up, it was not something that was actually done in production. And as a result, if you look at the photo on the right, by lifting up the canister just enough, you can see that the top nib is now going over the top of that groove and is now susceptible to coming out and when this canister was loaded with candy it's 40 pounds and it wound up on this woman's thigh which sent her to the ground and created a major injury. It also brought this into a third party action because not only was the retailer liable for allowing this condition to exist in the store, it brought the manufacturer in because they created this condition. So display, as I mentioned, is one of the culprits when it comes to injury, and it's critical that that gets a really good review when determining where does liability lie, and it's often going to take an expert witness who's familiar with engineering to, to, to spot this particular floor. Next frame. There are miscellaneous reasons, and we can go into that for the next two hours. I've chosen two obvious ones. The reason or the causes of this miscellaneous factor often happen with the shopping cart because that is a uh, moving device. You don't have a driver's license, so it's not always manipulated correctly. Um, a handicapped scooter, which is motorized, is usually found in every mass retail and major store in America. The parking lot, which I'll just brush over, but that's a whole subject onto itself in terms of regulations and some of the issues that do occur in parking lots. 
and it's not unfamiliar for a retailer to be very vocal when you come into their store in terms of what they expect your um, actions to be and what's allowed and not allowed in the parking lot. And once again, I call attention to aisle width because those that is one of the few items that actually is documented and, and regulated, so that's an easy one to determine if the store is in compliance. In order to prevent these, again, we need to create a, a level of inspection. There needs to be a really good procedure manual that's going to address all of these issues and conditions. Very often, you need the manufacturer's instructions to uh, help augment some of the safety aspects of how to utilize this device, and it needs to be conveyed to the shopper. And we do have regulatory agencies, and we need to be in compliance with them. And with that needs to be proper written notice so the customer is fully aware of what can be or not can be done with whatever they're working with. So in the case of the photo on the left, this is a strange condition to have a column sitting in the middle of an aisle because when this store was first designed, I will guarantee you that that column was sitting in the gondola display run and not encroaching on the aisle. But over time, those creative managers who decided they're going to maybe shorten the aisle width or try to get an extra display somewhere later down the line in this store, really failed to determine that by doing that move, it was going to create this condition. This condition is point blank in violation of OSHA, local building department regulations, and ADA. So what can be done? Again, daily inspection, however, this was a, a, a executive decision and had the, that executive had a good procedure manual, this would not have occurred because they would have known immediately this was not in, in accordance to regulations. Some stores actually go around and the employees talk about the three-foot rule. And those are some of the ways you reinforce um, that every aisle needs to be three feet. So they've, they've banged into their staff help, who at least when they see it can do something about it. In this particular case, I'm sure this has been in existence for months without it being picked up. I happened to see it when I was doing inspection in this particular store. When it comes to the regulatory agencies, they do address this. And again, proper notice either to the staff manager would have known that this can occur. Now, to the scooter side, we don't require people showing driver's licenses in order to use a handicapped scooter. Anybody and anyone can walk up to the courtesy desk and say, I'd like to use the scooter. But the smart retailer is going to have a sign there that says either, you know, we need to validate that you're capable, we need to test your skill, or we need you to sign off on the fact that you are familiar with the safety procedures of this scooter and will follow them throughout your use of the store. Also, these are not allowed in parking lots, which they often wind up in. So in this particular case, and it was for the defense, uh, they did their due diligence, they kept the manufacturer's warning labels on the scooter. They had by the scooter notices stating that the scooter is going to be used at the customer's risk and uh, they need to follow safe uh, practice. And the reality was that an elderly individual on the scooter rode into the back of another elderly individual that threw her on the ground and caused a really serious accident. So the only way the retail was able to escape any litigation was the fact that they were able to show, as I mentioned very early in this uh, webinar, that they did take normal procedure, not out of the ordinary, but just normal procedure to try to alleviate any serious accident 
and doing that by noting the regulation of how it gets used. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the fact that we really are short on having industry standards of care, and I'm often asked by an attorney on our initial uh, call, so what's the industry standard of care? And unfortunately, the answer is, well, there really isn't any in this particular case that you're explaining to me. But there are standards that have been established over time and not in writing, or it is just common sense procedure that many retailers do, and as a result, you've seen them over and over again. You've seen Home Depot or Lowe's actually uh, take a, a screen and put it across an aisle when a high-low is being used in the aisle. These are all procedures, even though not required or, or regulated, do exist and are followed on a daily basis with no exception. And anyone in that store that tries to do it otherwise is going to get their hand slapped or look for another job. In the only standards that I have been able to call upon for help are local building codes, and they mainly are going to address what are the correct materials that should be used in certain conditions, what are the dimensions that are required by law in order to leave enough passage for uh, people to circulate properly, as well as fire egress is um, calculated in terms of how many people are within the store in terms of occupancy level. If there's a certain amount of people, then the aisle widths need to get increased. And if the retailer doesn't comply with that, they leave, they leave themselves to exposed to liability uh, issues. And the standards basically occur as illustrated in this middle diagram in terms of how a door swings, can it swing into an aisle, if so, how much space needs to be left over in that aisle, and a whole slew of other issues, even the height of doorknobs and, and signage. Um, it's pretty well defined, and there are not too many gray matter in dealing with building code issues. The ADA actually will override local building codes and become an extremely strong um, regulatory agency. And when a building inspector goes through, he's not only looking to make sure there's compliance with the building code, he's also making sure, or she is making sure, that the uh, ADA issues are intact. And things as simple as, well, when you use a wheelchair, your hands are over the side of the handles that you're uh, sitting on, and those could be scraping against walls if you didn't have enough clearance. Or if two wheelchairs are trying to pass each other, then that becomes problematic if the aisle width is not uh, wide enough. And it's not even a matter of courtesy or, or making life easy. It gets down to even more serious issues because if you're in a situation where there's a fire and you're trying to escape a building and you start to have to stop it because somebody has to pass you before you can go, that's not good. And that, that leads to, I talked about serious accidents, that's going to lead to death. And so ADA is critical. And in ADA we find references to aisle widths, dimensions, accessibility, and their standards. The last agency is OSHA, which is basically designed for factory workers and was put into effect to make sure that owners of factories um, don't take advantage and make sure they're wearing the right safety protective helmets and that the working conditions are adequate, that they deal with fire extinguishers and regulatory issues regarding fire, and that equipment like ladders or uh, movable equipment are of the highest caliber and meet a certain standard. Um, and it happens in many cases now where these issues start to creep into the sales floor. The photo on the right is an example. This is a store that sells tires and this particular area is near a bathroom and 
there needs to be access to this bathroom by customers, both handicapped and otherwise. And the retailer has decided to place tires in this main aisle, which is cutting its capacity in half. And this aisle is also an egress aisle for fire. So this is not good. And any time an accident or a fire would have occurred, and you go back to this condition, it's not going to sit well for that particular retailer. And the reality is it's not helping their case. Next slide. So now the question I'm going to propose is why do we need a retail expert as opposed to perhaps engineer or an architect? And the reason is that retail is a unique, this, a unique animal. And in terms of design, it's not about aesthetics as much as it's about performance. And the first and foremost in retail is make money so you can afford to pay your employees and pay your lease and pay for the electricity. And part of that boils down to generating as many dollars per square foot as you possibly can. And that starts to become motivation for retailers at store level to start to um, modify what's considered normal and justifiable and it puts them into a situation where they've now created a liability issue where it really wasn't necessary. So one of my adages is form follows function. And understanding of how and why conditions are created to me is important when you review a retail environment because you really understand the motivation and what created that condition. Some of that motivation may be very harmless. Some of it may be very um, methodical, in the, methodical in the sense that it was created to the benefit of the store and not concerned about the effect on the customer. I also feel that there's a lot of logic that's being done and some of these decisions are justifiable that retailers do at store level, but many of them become real hazardous and liable um, and should not have occurred. The real application um, on how a customer interacts with product is a very essential element to most accidents and it's important that the retailer did not create a condition of display presentation that would have made it difficult or ergonomically impractical for that customer to deal with the product. So that's an assessment that I believe someone who's involved with retail and understands it can do a better job of uh, supporting an argument as to the fact that, that the store was negligent in the way they did the product. As far as display decisions go, uh, knowledge of design is, is is essential and the method of manufacturing. I find that many items that come in from China are really half-baked. The edges of metal are in ground, they're sharp, but sometimes they can even be razor sharp, and they're just an element that's allowed to sit out there and eventually start to create major cuts and injuries when interacting with the customer. So in assessing these displays, it's at least through experience you know the quality and the level of manufacturing which I believe is something that someone who's involved with retail would recognize a lot easier than someone other than a person working in that industry. Um, also the understanding of how the customer works with the product we discussed and then there's the issue of self-service which basically is telling the customer alright you're on your own pick what you choose, demonstrate it, try it, feel it, touch it, do what you want. Um, and in essence, if you have done your job to present it well and not have anything other than um, the elements such as lighting and other issues uh, be satisfactory, then you're kind of off the hook in terms of something goes wrong. I did have at one time a cup that fell out of a box 
that went on to a person who severed a ligament. And the reality was not the retailer's fault, but the way the box was constructed and what that vendor expected of a, of a consumer really led the liability to the product manufacturer. When it comes to construction design, yes, an engineer architect are certainly qualified and able to come up with the same observations that I would. And again, I do want to point out that I am an architect, but I consider myself a merchant first. Uh, so in construction design, knowledge of construction techniques and installations are essential. And circulation is very important because you don't want to lead people into dead corners or into blind corners that if they make a turn they're walking into somebody or something. So those are issues that need to be considered when designing at a store. Now in my opinion there are approximately 50 factors beyond what we've discussed today that all can impact the safety of the store. We do plan to send out to each of you a list of these 50 factors because they're all essential to be reviewed when one assesses an, an accident scene and who in fact would have been liable. Um, there is a customer reaction and level of expectation for shopping. Customers through experience have been trained to accept or expect certain motions, actions that they are used to doing and will do it and therefore it's not a hazardous expectation. There are other ways that things are uh, presented to customers which could in fact, I'm sorry, in fact lead to an injury because they're not used to dealing with that. So those are issues that need to be reviewed at store level if there is an accident. And uh, lastly, that carts which need to weigh traffic and checkouts are another area where you're restricted and funneled down into a smaller area where certain accidents have been known to occur. Um, dealing with heavy product is another issue that stores need to advise consumers you know, you, we don't want you pulling your back out, so call a, an associate to help. Um, we have all will say, well, that's all good, but it takes like a half an hour to find an associate. So there's got to be a happy medium because, in my opinion, the associate should have been readily available. There should have been a phone to get that associate over there to help. And if I think after 30 minutes of trying, you can't, then your frustration level puts you in a position where you're going to do it yourself. And then, then the question is, should you have done it or should you have waited more time to have assistance? Um, then there's, again, as, that, that relates to the interaction with the staff. Next. So quickly on the 50 factors, to me they are critical to the case. They, they, you need them to understand how and why a condition was created. It helps with the retailer's logistic or logic to figure out what was their decision behind how they created a condition that ultimately led to an injury and whether they were realistic in the application of how the consumer is going to interact with the product. From the attorney's side, the strategy that you're going to have to establish when handling these cases is getting a handle on the knowledge of design and the method of the manufacturing to determine where the fault theoretically falls and then go out and try to prove it. Uh, the experience knowing uh, how customers interact is critical and what a common sense analysis would be in terms of how customers react with displays and product. And when does the self-service start to become a liability to the customer or to the retailer? Next. So I'm not going to bore you with all of these factors, but I want you to be aware that items that you probably have never thought about really do play a part and a role, and it could be one, two, or all of them that are leading factors in terms of what caused an injury and how does a retailer avoid getting stuck being the person of blame, and where does a consumer fall in terms of well how much of this would should they have been aware of and made um, 
an attempt to avoid. And it includes, as we mentioned before, lighting levels. If the place is too dark, it's an issue. And more and more today, as a side note, um, with baby boomers as a major part of the population, when, when they get and reach the older age, they start to lose certain faculties, such as the ability to um, determine contrast, the ability to adjust to the change of light. So when they come in from a parking lot and it's sunlight, when they come into the store, the eye has a tendency of almost blacking out the environment and you can't see anything. Um, there's issues of are they able to ex access items that are above shoulder height or can they pick up items that are below knee? These are all contributing factors as to why there's an injury. Uh, eye location, I won't beat to death. Display systems really need to be um, doing what they're intended to do and not jury rigged to try to come up in, with a functionality that they're not intended to do. Ergonomics is a study unto itself, but most of it is very obvious. And there are a lot of guidelines in terms of what a normal reach would be. Customer interaction with product we reviewed, angles imposed to review product. Again, if a chair is, is sitting above eye level and you want to try sitting in this chair, you're asking that customer to pull it off and bring it down to the floor and it may be too heavy for them to handle and there's a sense of uh, if you lift it from the wrong place, it starts to move on its own. So those are important issues. There's a template which is referred to as a planogram. Once a store has determined the correct way to load product on the shelf, this planogram keeps it consistent throughout the year. Very often stores don't follow the planogram, which puts the directive from home office uh, into a gray area, which often leads to a product falling and becoming a problem. There's the issue of permanent displays versus non-permanent displays. Signage is critical, and if we go back to our exercise before, even though we were very clear in a statement, we didn't perceive it or read it correctly, and there are many more of those in the English language that we make assumptions that the, someone is going to understand, but it really needs additional clarity. So notices need to really be well reviewed and, and presented and, and and front and center. Rules of the parking lot, as I mentioned, is a subject unto itself. Um, there are a lot of other circumstances that lead to uh, third party being responsible. And for instance, display manufacturers are often put to the, to the, car, to the hand into the fire because they're told by the retailer, make it cheaper, make it cheaper. So they make it cheaper and by doing so, they forget that 10 cent screw that created positive connection and now they put themselves in a place where they're going to be liable because the manufacturing end was incorrect. Um, the area of uh, customer reviewing product we reviewed, the customer um, reviewing or having an ample space to review the product is critical. The stacking we saw from that white piece of furniture really became an avalanche and it's not uncommon for that to occur. The effect of displays and making sure manufacturing instructions are used. In one case, uh, manufacturers tell people in warehouses do not step on the stockroom shelving uh, and use it as a ladder and then the store goes ahead because it's easy and they just go step on the, the shelves and that creates a big problem. Next. So this brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for hanging in there and listening to my years of experience, hopefully uh, some bells went off in the head in terms of what to look for next time you're involved with a retail case. And um, I'd like to turn this back over to Michael. All right, Jerry. Thanks so much. Great presentation. Um, now it's time for our Q&A. And so I'd like everyone to take some time and if you have any questions for Jerry, you can type your questions into the uh, question box in your control panel and Jerry will answer you verbally. And so our first question 
Uh, when it comes to discovery, are there set items that should be asked for? Well, that's a good question, Michael. Um, I believe more is more. Beyond the obvious, people such as eyewitnesses or store personnel who were first on the scene or who filled out accident reports or the store manager, security video, accident reports, those are usually the, the no-brainers that we all go after to get. But there are other items that could be very beneficial if we know to get to ask for them. As an example, corporate procedures or manuals on how merchandising should be done or what does someone do during an accident in order to document and be sure that uh, both attorneys can uh, have something to review when it comes down to that particular time of the case um, often doesn't happen. And to me, depending on the kind of accident, there are many other variables. For instance, district managers who are individuals that circulate within a particular zone of geography are pretty knowledgeable because they deal with the same issues and they have the ability to compare it store to store. Department managers are important because they'll tell you what they were told to do or what they did not do. Corporate heads, even at the home office, have a um, responsibility to convey messages, so they need to be polled every once in a while in terms of, well, what is it you approved and what is it that you told the store to do? Store plans are important because they actually create the benchmark of where was the store at one given time. and and. At that given time, the store had to have gone to a building department who went over with a fine-tooth cone and approved it. So where, if any, are there variations that would put the retailer in a liability uh, position because they made or altered these without the approval of the building department? Uh, building department submittals that document when changes were done. Um, the actual display components are important because they could be defective or they could have something wrong inherently that keeps them from operating correctly um, and often were the reason for the accident. Then even the manufacturer of the display's purchase orders because it helps determine a, a frame of reference as to the time they were made, how many were made, does this same condition exist in other stores? Did it create accidents in other stores? So those are good documents to get a, hand, a handle on. And then the store specification as to, well, what is it that you ordered? Was it a stock item out of a catalog? Or is it something that you designed yourself? I currently have a case, can't go into it, other than the fact that the store designed a particular display that caused an accident and the, um, the specification that they made was not what was delivered to them. But in my mind, it doesn't put them off the hook because they shouldn't have accepted the display coming in with that uh, modification. So it, it makes the onus, in my mind, from the manufacturer back to the retailer for accepting it. Um, so those all above are, are what I would suggest, and very often if I'm called into a case early enough, um, it's my pleasure to assist the attorney with creating this list of discovery so that we really have everything we need to go after either the customer or the retailer. Next. Okay, next question. Should procedure manuals exist in retail stores for things such as store display design and shelving? Oh, the answer is definitely yes, and it does. If you uh, go to some of the big box, major, major chains, they have done an extremely good job of documenting every aspect of what's expected of their associates to be doing on a daily level how you handle merchandise, how many boxes you put on a shelf, um, how you handle peg hooks so that children don't have their eyes poked out, at what level do you stop putting peg hooks. Um, and there is one retailer who, in my mind, really stands out 
way above the others. I'm not going to mention it, but their uh, their focus on safety is incredible. And I'll I'll put it this way: that in that one example I showed with the vendor's product uh, had a vendor display. That one accident after the settlement amount is going to take that vendor three years of selling product before they break even on that accident. So most retailers are just product crazy and that's where they think and they dream and they, and they don't get beyond product. But their bottom line is so impact when it comes to lawsuit and customer um, acceptance and support that they tend not to put enough emphasis. So manuals are the retailer's best guide to get the store straightened out so they know what they're doing and to get everyone in the chain on the same page so um, accidents don't happen. Okay, next question. Would an industry standard that incorporates other standards such as ANSI, NFSI, um, ASTM, or ASSE for the purpose of loss control geared toward consumer safety in a retail establishment make sense? As you say, there is no written standard at this time. Well, it's, it would certainly make sense to address items that have not been addressed. Um, the ones that you call attention to, um, I have a feeling are could possibly contradict one another, but I'm not certain of that particular statement. But I, I don't know if pulling those regulations are the answer, but I do believe that there needs to be a better way to standardize the industry. And then they, you're going to definitely run into the issue of the entrepreneur one store operator versus chain store and they really wind up being two different scenarios even if the accident was identical. Um, they both have to get handled in a different manner just based on the, on the uh, playing field. All right, next question. Can you expand on the best practices for preventing liquid spills in a retail establishment? Yes. From my experience, it seems that the courts have been okay if you can prove that you were reviewing the store on a 15-minute increment. The problem in the store that had this liquid spill, and that was the store where I made reference to um, the water spots on the floor. Um, the problem in that store was that the, even though the store mandated that their employee walk the store on a 15-minute schedule and review the condition of the floor, the employee just interpreted that to mean all I have to do is walk around the perimeter of this 100,000 square foot store and look down all the secondary aisles as I walk by them to make sure that everything is copacetic and looks good. So the problem there is that when you're trying to evaluate a floor from 50 to 100 feet away and you have a reflection of the lights on the floor which have a, a tendency to look like spilled water, you cannot make a proper assessment as to is it water or isn't it water. The reality is that even though they they were half pregnant by making a review around the store, they were negligent in the fact that they avoided going down these secondary aisles and didn't inspect them and the ruling went in favor of the plaintiff because they took the shortcut. They, they were half-baked. Okay, um, this question comes from the gentleman who just asked the previous one. Would you be interested in co-authoring an industry standard? Uh, the answer is I certainly would be interested in participating. Um, it's not going to be easy, but why not? 
All right, great. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, now's the time. Um, one question is, will the slides be available for the presentation? Yes, we'll have the slides available and a copy of the video recording on a follow-up email tomorrow. All right, I think that's it. So thank you very much, Jerry. It was a great presentation. If anyone is interested in retaining Mr. Bernbach as an expert witness, please contact the Expert Institute and we will facilitate the engagement process. Thanks again, everyone, and stay tuned for more webinars in the near future. Thank you.